Now I'm going to come at this very much from the outside in. Um, and uh, you're not going to hear a lot about patients in my talk from a patient perspective. This is very much looking at the, at the big numbers around demand management. So I'm going to look at why we might think there are opportunities to manage demand, what, what has happened so far in our system, look at some of the evidence around three key areas, my own reflections on some of the barriers, and draw some conclusions. So this is a system map that actually stems from the days when I was working at the Department of Health. Um, and it just uh, puts in a, a quantified term all the different activity around the system. And it was devised by the, the DH because they were wanting to explore what might happen if you flex different parts of the system. And um, so I just found it a really helpful way of encapsulating the system in which we might be trying to manage demand. So there's the A&E side of demand, the open access service, which has traditionally been a big problem. And you will have heard some of the statistics being banded around recently in that um, case with the trust that was using the army to try and support its, its A&E activity. Elective patients, so those in our system that are referred via GPs to get into the system be seen by specialists and emergency inpatients. So in the main flow through A&E, but actually, of course, we've got a, a models too where GPs can refer directly into medical assessment units. So why do we think we can manage that great bulk of activity that is out there? Well, there's lots of evidence in each of those areas that actually the activity that goes through that system doesn't necessarily have to go through the system. Now there's a whole other issue as to whether it's appropriate or inappropriate and I'll come back to that because often from a patient perspective they do see it as appropriate but from our perspective are we aligning sort of very highly skilled resource and technology to need there's a big question as to whether we've got that right. And in A&E and in elective care, there's some really significant percentages which indicate that actually we're using our high-tech facilities, our highly specialised staff, to manage patients who don't necessarily need that level of sophistication in their management. And alongside that, we have huge variation in the rate at which people do use those um, facilities and evidence that actually partly that's due to the distance that they live from them. So if you live closer to a hospital, you're much more likely to be admitted to it. And there is very little evidence to tell us whether that's clinically appropriate or otherwise. We're just doing some work at the moment around the way in which acute beds are utilised around the country, particularly focusing on people who are over 65. And this is the rate that you see, the variation in the rate per population across acute providers. So you've got nearly a fourfold variation in the rate at which acute beds are used. And that underlines the point and the premise that actually, surely, some of that variation is unwarranted. And part of that variation links to the very long lengths of stays that some people have in hospitals, which again, um, we'd have to question how appropriate that is. And our research is, is um, unearthing some really fascinating statistics about those lengths of stay, how they vary between providers, and their link to particularly the over 85s actually, rather than the over 65s, and whether the hospital represents the transition between home and a supported facility, in which case you might, you, you can expect from the data significantly longer lengths of stay and huge, again, huge variations between different providers. The other thing I wanted to sort of get across is something that's sort of around gearing. There's actually a managing demand in one bit of the system can have bigger or lesser effects on the other. So if you start on the left hand side of this diagram, the number of incidents that are um, the DH model suggested happen within people in their normal daily lives are absolutely massive. And people create their own triage as to whether they're going to take themselves off to the GP or A&E. If you um, flex the ease with which they can do that, you can see 
what a significant impact it could have on services. And for my money, that's one of the big explanations of some of the explosion we've seen around nominally A&E attendances is actually we've created a lower threshold for people in terms of accessing some of these out-of-hospital services. It also, um, if you look at GP consultation through to elective care, one of the things I would note here is that we already have a very effective gatekeeping system between GPs and elective care. Um, but again, as we'll come on to, there's big variation in, in the rates at which they um, refer on. So what's been happening to demand? Well, as you can see from the graph on the left, A&E attendance is um, growing to this over um, 20 million mark. One thing I would point out is that six, the actual attendances at what we might understand to be A&E departments is pretty flat. The big growth is in the attendances at urgent care and walk-in centres, and they are the um, that's what takes you up to the 20 million. So it's about 13 million has been going consistently through to main A and E departments. The 6 million is these new facilities. First outpatient attendances, interestingly, um, has changed quite significantly recently, and that has flattened off, and that's the first time that um, we've we've seen that in recent times. Non-elective inpatient admissions, um, not rising at the rate at which they were, um, do seem to be flattening off. One of, the, of course, the, the drivers of, that, of the big growth in non-elective admissions was the naught to one day stays, which again distort the overall picture. And elective inpatient admissions, again, a sort of steady growth. So, um, one of the other key factors, and again it's underlined by the work we've been doing on acute beds, is the way in which our older populations are one of the big demand drivers in our system. And I think this graph for me was very telling. So if you look at the over 75 year olds in the last 10 years, we've seen a 60% increase in FCEs for that age group, whereas we've only seen a 20% increase for the 0 to 14s. So we are treating more intensively our older people. So just a quick canter through some of the evidence that we've got in each of the areas. What can stem the flow to them? In A&E, self-management, there's some good evidence. And something that's coming through now, and in fact some of you may be users of it, something called the Bolton dashboard. Um, so that provides real-time feedback to GPs about the use that their patients make of urgent care facilities. And that has been shown to really influence how, how people manage their patients and revealing to GPs for the first time that they've got patients who are multiply attending and actually got a problem that clearly needs sorting but they weren't aware of it. You almost don't have a day where people talk uh, despairingly about the loss of GP out of hours services and the impact that's had on the system. I have to say the evidence around the net impact of GP out of hours services is, is pretty minimal so more, more evidence is needed. And then, as I was alluding to earlier, I'm afraid there's very little evidence that walk-in and urgent care centres manage demand. If anything, uh, my argument would be that they probably expand it. The same, I'm afraid, is true of NHS Direct. It doesn't mean, again, that they don't meet needs that patients don't appreciate, but if you're looking at these as interventions that will drew, reduce use of A&E, then you are probably not going to be um, uh, rewarded. And there's also um, some question as to how cost-effective using GPs in A&E are. Again, it comes back to the critical mass of patients and GPs and how expensive they are. And actually, a lot of this caseload was very cost-effectively managed by nurses through um, triage in A&E. <coughs> and this slide is just underlining the sort of challenges around changing patients' use of services in the urgent care um, setting. And actually, from a patient's perspective, their use of A&E is highly appropriate. They see their need as urgent, and thus they take themselves there. And I'm also, I think, something that's perhaps not well understood 
always by physicians in particular is how difficult it can be for patients to distinguish between what is life-threatening or not life-threatening, a statistic that I suspect most lay people do not have at the top of their mind is that only 1% of attendances at A&E are life-threatening. I think if you ask the average um, lay person, they would expect it to be 50 or 60%. They really don't understand how few um, on occasions these things are life-threatening. This, as I was referring to earlier, is the Bolton Urgent Care dashboard, and um, they do seem to have resulted in some significant reductions in use of a &E. In terms of elective care, so this is GP referrals into um, secondary care. Um, this is an area where my colleague, who's sitting over there, Chris Naylor, and I did a, a, a major piece of work on referral management, and um, our analysis was that peer review and audit, there is um, a good and I think strengthening evidence base about the benefit of that. And many, I think, emerging CCGs talk about the impact that feeding back information to GPs has on their behaviour. The services we were more equivocal about in terms of their cost effectiveness in particular, I think rather than actually do they or do they not stop referrals into secondary care were these intermediate ones and in fact we're about and we hope well we've put in a bid to do a major piece of work on referral management centres to really try and get underneath the economic case for them it's quite clear in some areas they they do stem referrals but do they do it in a cost effective manner and the same is certainly true of tier two services um, Areas where the evidence base would suggest cost effectiveness really isn't um, there always is the use of GPWSIs, the GPs with special interest, consultant outreach clinics, and certainly just sort of issuing clinical guidelines has, has, has precious little effect on its own. Um, this is sort of, from our perspective, but one of the great values of peer review and audit was that it was really helping GPs develop their skills and understanding around referrals. It was getting at the core of the problem. Um, there is, as I was saying earlier, a massive variation in referral rate by GPs, up to tenfold for some particular specialties. And that clearly signals that there's a sort of an education need there for some GPs. And not surprisingly so, it sort of not all GPs can manage all conditions to the same level of sophistication. There is also quite a fundamental issue in some areas, though I suspect it's improving, around the quality of referral letters that GPs send into secondary care, and that really undermines the efficiency and effectiveness of secondary care in its own right. And so I think some of the referral management centres have felt feeding back to GPs about quality has been a very valuable thing. And as I said, um, referral management centres can um, produce some, some quality benefits. We heard some very powerful stories from GPs who worked in these centres and the insight they felt it gave them to their health system um, in a way that actually if you're sitting in your individual GP practice it can be very difficult to understand the complex array of services and providers out there and by sitting in those centres they actually got that um, sense of the whole system and how it, how it worked. Um, and in some areas they felt that they were um, picking up referrals that hadn't been fast-tracked and were then fast-tracking them and that was clearly a positive thing. Um, but they have to be managed really well in our view to have the really best impact and we did see some quite scary, I have to say, examples of centres that were not managed well. And I think there's a, a global issue about the governance frameworks we put round out of hospital services because they don't have the same level of scrutiny that hospital services do and there's been some quite I think sort of cavalier in many respects um, initiatives that have, that have happened in uh, the community. And this was a piece of analysis that we did as part of our referral management research. So what you're seeing here are the percentage changes in referrals from GPs by GP, by PCT um, in the period 2005 to 2009. And you, A, you can see that there's huge variation, so it goes from just under 0% up to 40% increase in referrals. But the dark bars in that graph are the places that had referral management centres. 
So we had great difficulty in seeing that they universally had an impact on stemming referrals. Clearly there's a cluster here at the bottom that do seem to have had quite a strong effect, but um, it certainly wasn't universally true. I'm not going to talk a lot about non-elective care because I think Linda's presentation covers that off um, very well and I uh, think Sue will also be touching upon it. Um, there's a lot of evidence around various things that can have an effect on, on admissions to hospital. The one thing I would say is that my observation around the evidence is that while you can have that effect, the evidence around cost effectiveness of those initiatives is much more limited. Um, and actually, yes, you can deliver a better quality of care for the patient, but don't assume that it's going to save you lots of money. And people tend to look and sort of see the headline reduction in, in, elective, in non elective admissions and think, oh, so I'm going to get, you know, however much because it's a thousand odd pounds per admission. Um, it isn't necessarily so. Um, and as I was saying, earlier, um, new technology hopefully is an area that might start to, to make cost effectiveness um, be a lot more um, of, of the outcome. And we've just had some very positive results from the, the Wisdom, um, the whole system demonstrator sites that have been going on in this country. My yellow box in the corner is some of the caveats around the positive things. You do need to be very targeted in the way that you use um, telecare or indeed any case management approach has to be incredibly well targeted to, to deliver um, cost effectiveness and be part of a broader approach. Again, a generic message from the evidence around these um, initiatives that are developed in the community. They need to be part of an integrated whole. If you do things in little piecemeal pockets, they really are not going to have the impact that, that you want. And this is my own sort of just intuitive take on some of the behavioural obstacles that are to be overcome, because I think, again, we forget at our peril um, that this is about changing people's behaviour in the system. And not only, as I was saying earlier, do patients see their own behaviours appropriate, you know, how many times have you heard people talk about, oh, these inappropriate senses, we're just going to have a public information campaign, they're all going to realise that they should go, they should go to this other place and not really get inside the heads of, of patients. Um, in terms of GPs, as I was saying, we've got a huge issue of the variation of skills and performance within general practice and it's desperate need to move up to be what we called in the Kins Fund from the sort of cottage industry to the industrial model of, of general practice. Um, they do have tightly contra defined contractual obligations and I think it's an open question as to what the impact of CCGs might be upon that. It clearly has the potential to be quite a strong binding positive force. Our key concern here at the fund is will it support the development of GPs as providers as much as commissioners because that's where the change really needs to happen. And clearly as far as consultants are concerned, um, there's a whole dynamic there with the interdependence with junior doctors and how we use our medical workforce across the country um, and the, the difficulty one can find in changing a consultant's timetable. So, clearly there is a massive opportunity to use acute hospitals in particular in a very different way to quote unquote manage the demand, but certainly it isn't easy and delivering savings is much harder and it is going to require significant behaviour change but there is some really positive stuff around use of benchmarking peer review information feedback and self-management again and new technology are some really positive interventions going forward so thank you very much